Well, the name is Volterra, but the Etruscan name was Filatri. That is uh, a name that we don't know what means. But the root of the Vel is for city. So uh, the name of Volterra was a city of Atri. And uh, after, during the Roman and, uh, period, the, the name was Volaterre. And after, the name uh, in moder modern, uh, Volterre, and after, Volterra. One of the things that, that just struck me about Volterra was how there's so much history that it, it can't all be written in a book. And so one of the things that's led me to want to learn so much about the city of Volterra is the fact that there is so much left open to interpretation and discovery. The city of Volterra was constructed uh, by the Etruscans uh, early 10th century before Christ and it was one of the biggest cities of the Tuscany uh, controlled by Etruscans. It was uh, an important city because uh, the Etruscans controlled the mines, the mines of iron, of silver, of copper that are in the uh, surrounding of the city and uh, the city survived the Tudor Roman period and it was an important city in, during the medieval period. It's Tuscany's oldest continuously inhabited town, so that means we have archaeological evidence of it being inhabited since at least 1500 BC. We don't know what the population was in that period, but we do have an idea of the population in the fourth century BC. So this is before the Romans reached Volterra. This is when Volterra was an Etruscan city-state. And we believe the population was about 20,000 people. Now that meant it was a mega metropolis for the ancient world. It means that Volterra was larger than Rome for a few decades. Um, and it also means that Volterra in the fourth century BC had more inhabitants than it does today, because today there are 12,000 people. But if we actually use the parameters they used in centuries past, which is just to count the people inside the city walls, today that would make Volterra 5,000 people, again compared to 20,000 back in the 4th century BC. We kind of lose track of the population for many centuries, although we think it was probably similar in the Roman period when the Roman theater was used. Um, but in the 13th century, before the Black Plague will hit, the population was somewhere around 30, 35,000 people. So this was one of the main population centers in central Italy, in Tuscany. Uh, it was once a mighty, populous, powerful town. And that pretty much comes to an end in the year 1472. That's the year that the independent city-state of Volterra was conquered by Florence, um, when they're in the process of uniting Tuscany. And they leave their mark in many ways. Um, but one of the things they do is they burn down the top plateau of the city, where there was the prime real estate, the bishop's palace, the important churches and whatnot. And they build themselves the largest Medici fortress ever built. It takes them just three years, which is amazing, um, to build this mighty fortress. And they will, in the beginning, they'll use it um, as protection against the Volterran people themselves. So it's like Florentine Volterra protecting itself against the Volterans, and they will point their artillery towards the town hall building so they can fire against it should the local people try to rebel against Florentine rule. And they also leave this beautiful green park area around it, though I don't think they were thinking about the fact that it was nice for people to take a picnic in the park, but they wanted it to be a buffer zone so they couldn't have people doing a surprise attack, hiding in lanes and alleys and coming against the fortress. Uh, soon after building the fortress, the Florentines will start to use it as a prison. Um, it wasn't a prison in the modern sense of the term. It was really a place where you were sent to die. The prisoners was normally closed in, a, in a rooms and the, the door of the room was um, closed for uh, forever. And when uh, the people was dead, uh, the door was, when, uh, is open and they go to the cemetery. This is one of the dark presences in Volterra. There were torture chambers that were infamous throughout Europe. Uh, people talk also about voices, people who live around the fortress. Uh, inmates in the fortress talk about voices that they hear of, of people wailing and, and crying and then perhaps the voices of, of ghosts of people of centuries past. There's another dark presence in Volterra um, 
which is no longer open, thank goodness, and it was the Psychiatric Institute. It was open for about 200 years. It was like a parallel city to Volterra. It had about 6,000 patients. This was the second largest poll for Italy's mentally ill. Now, in many periods, it really was at the avant-garde in mental health care, and uh, a lot of new theories and practices were developed in the Psychiatric Institute of Volterra. But unfortunately, it was also a place where societies unwanted were sent. So people who weren't necessarily mentally ill, orphans who couldn't fit into orphanages, people who society found difficult and didn't know what to do with them, didn't know where to send them, they were sent to the Psychiatric Institute. There too, in the area where the Psychiatric Institute used to be, people still talk about mysterious presences and voices in the nights. So, Volterra is a setting, is a town where there are dark presences, and these are just two of many examples. It's not hard in a place like Volterra to imagine another dark presence, such as the Volturi. Volterra is an odd city, many people would say, uh, because there is a, a very a disproportionate religious presence, if you will, that leads some people to wonder if the city has needed extra protection over the centuries for some reason. Um, for example, there are several dozen churches in Voltaire. Uh, there, we have more patron saints than Rome. Uh, the city is the birthplace of five popes, um, which, if I'm not mistaken, is a claim to fame that not even the city of Florence can make. Um, why does Volterra have this strong religious presence? I mean, usually you collect or are assigned patron saints um, because of their presence in the cities or because of the need for extra protection for bouts of plague or the presence of something dark and mysterious. I'd heard since I was a kid that there were vampire myths happening in Volterra, never as kind of like developed as, for example, what Stephanie Mayer went into. But it did seem, knowing the city very well, reading the book, it did seem to make a lot of sense that there could be an ancient group of people residing under the streets in Volterra just because there's so much of the city that's unknown and so many little crevices that aren't yet really discovered. And being an old Etruscan city and the language being not deciphered yet, it seems very probable that something like that could happen. We have realized the connection with Etruscans and uh, this part of, uh, uh, the, of the book of uh, Stephanie Meyer. Uh, we haven't uh, legend by vampire or other things in Volterra, but the most important uh, mystery is about the Etruscan because uh, we don't know all about the uh, Etruscan. The presence of the Volturi in Volterra, how can you explain that? Uh, well, Stephanie Meyer suggests that it was because of a pact made about 3,000 years ago with the ancient Etruscans, who were truly the inhabitants of the land of Tuscany and of Volterra in particular. Um, and it, it, so it's this pact with the Etruscans that allows the Volturi to have the city uh, as their base. Um, but the Etruscans get something in return that we believe, we hope, is still valid today, which is that the Volturi and vampires in general are not allowed to quench their thirst with the blood of the people of Volterra. There is a monument in Volterra called Porta al Arco. It means the arched gate. It's a fourth century BC Etruscan gate, part of the Etruscan wall surrounding the city, um, that's been used ever since. Um, we believe that's the gate that Alice and Bella and Edward um, used to flee from the city of Volterra uh, after escaping from the Volturi. Um, and on the exterior of that gate, there are three dark gray stones. Now, these stones have been a mystery to historians for centuries. They seem to be heads or faces of some sort. Originally, the historians thought maybe they were heads of lions. More recently, they thought they were heads of Etruscan divinities meant to protect the city of Volterra. Um, but today, there's a new interpretation, especially considering the fact that these dark heads are faceless and hard to, hard to determine and you know, recognize exactly who they are. People are now wondering if perhaps they really could represent Aro, Caius, and Marcus, if this is a way of showing the city of Volterra and everyone who visits it who's really in charge in town. 
E il fenomeno di Twilight si lega molto bene a, a, alle caratteristiche di Volterra perché eh, esalta le sue caratteristiche di fascino e di mistero. Per cui i 3000 anni di storia di Volterra danno alla città quella atmosfera, quella sorta di aura di eh, fascino appunto di, e di mistero eh, che ben si eh, coniuga, che ben si sposa con, con Twilight, con la, la saga. We were famous first for the Etruscans, which are, are mysterious people, we don't know a lot of them. Then we were <laughs> famous for the... We had um, the prison, of course, there has always been a prison here, so you don't know quite well what's going on. And now we have Volturi, so Volterra has always been, as you say, a mysterious city. So this is just a piece in the puzzle. You really do feel like you could see a clan of vampires walking down the street in the evening, especially in the winter where there's like bats flying everywhere. By the beginning of the 1900s, we think the population was again around 35, 40,000 people. Um, and Voltaire was a booming alabaster town at that point in time, known for its uh, carved statues of dancing girls and light fixtures. And it, Voltaire was the city of alabaster. At that point in time, it was the only known source of this beautiful white translucent stone um, in the Western Hemisphere. Volturi, they are um, they are made out of stone, what we read out of the books. So, of course, it was clear that it had it was alabaster. They uh, are shining, so they are like like alabaster. Really, it it is also this coincidence is really amazing. So, alabaster is the stone of Volterra. Um, it is worked here, and why the Volturi? At least it. Italian Volturi, the, the Italian vampires, the Volturi, they are for sure made out of alabaster. By the mid 1900s, uh, the population started to decrease as Volterra chose to not industrialize and other towns would, so the population decreased as people left this increasingly rural, isolated town and moved to larger cities. I first found out about the New Moon book and about the Twilight series when Stephanie Meyer came to Volterra. Some time passed before a good friend of mine uh, suggested that I read New Moon. He, he called me up and said, Annie, you won't believe it, this book has Volterra in it. Um, and so he actually gave me the book and said, here, read this now. Well, I flipped through the book and I don't think it took more than 20 pages for me to really get into the story. And I don't remember exactly, but I think I finished the whole book in about 48 hours. Um, it's a long book, and that meant, I think I stayed up till about four in the morning, two nights in a row, but in any case, I got really into the story. Um, before reading the book, I already knew that Stephanie Meyer had not been to Volterra. But with that in mind, as I read through the details of her sections on Volterra, I was really surprised by how many details she got right. In general, the feel for Volterra, but also the location of things and how she described the city. I was very surprised uh, that she got so many things right. It was kind of uncanny, actually. Era veramente sorpresa. Abbiamo fatto il giro di Volterra e quando è arrivata nella piazza dei Priori con la torre dell'orologio ha detto proprio è come me l'ero immaginata e quindi eh, è stato un, un momento particolare perché sembrava che lei avesse comunque vissuto o visto Volterra in un'altra occasione e l'avesse riportata eh, all'interno del libro così come era. Anche il percorso che noi abbiamo eh, studiato dentro la città che segue il libro dà quasi l'impressione di una persona che conosce bene la città perché non abbiamo avuto grosse difficoltà a ricostruire il percorso di Edward e Bella all'interno della città. Stephanie Meyer I find to be an amazing story weaver and, and creates these really compelling characters. And so I immediately went out and bought myself a clips and then waited for Breaking Dawn. And then, because of course I made the error of starting with New Moon, went back and read 
Twilight and then read the whole series once again. So I guess I can consider myself in the class of the converted. Um, I really like the books. I suggest them to my friends. Um, I think they are of interest to really all age groups. Um, and everyone finds something compelling about at least one of the characters in the book. There's something about the accessibility of the books and the description of the characters that really makes you understand them on a different level and kind of you feel like you know them only within a couple pages. Um, Stephanie Mayer is, manages to describe them, in my opinion, in an impeccable way, making you really, you know, hate the bad guys and love the good guys and, you know, the whole Team Edward, Team Jacob thing. They're really, you have to pick a side with it because you feel so attached to the characters emotionally that it's difficult to kind of get yourself out of the world once you're in it. When I was reading New Moon, we were actually here in Italy and the chapter on Voltaire, I was reading it like a couple of days before we came here, so that was um, quite interesting. And as soon as I got here, I was really excited because I felt like I could imagine different parts of the book here. The scenes were fresh in my mind and everywhere I was going, I was trying to think, is, is this maybe where Stephanie Meyer got her inspiration from? I mean, I don't know if she ever visited here, but that's kind of what I thought. Um, yeah, and even now, like when I look around, I, I still think about things like that. So, yeah, I think it captured it really well in the book. I ordered the books, but I first of all read only chapter 20 in book number two to get an idea of what should I tell people. But of course, it didn't give me an idea of the whole story. So only then I started book number one, having already read book, uh, tr num chapter 20 in book number two. But I read all four of them, even the philosophy of Twilight. Because I was just interested, it was part of my job. And of course, we, lo we love our job, we put our heart into our job, and Twilight became part of it. I'd heard of the books living in the States, but I never really read them. Um, it was mostly when I came to Volterra and there was news of Stephanie Mayer coming and visiting to present the novel that my grandfather bought me a copy of, um, of New Moon, published in Italian. and. I hadn't read it yet, I'm not a big fan of reading in Italian, so, but I said, you know, what the heck, let's go to the book signing and hear a bit about what the book is about. So I stood in line for about two hours to get my book signed by an author whose books I hadn't even read yet, felt kind of phony. And once I got up on stage, she just came off as a very genuine person, so since I hadn't had, I didn't have Twilight yet as a book, I decided to go online and I purchased it and I read it, I devoured it within 12 hours. I just, I couldn't put it down, and so then I read New Moon and then Eclipse and Breaking Dawn eventually when they also came out. There is not only teenager people, there is also people of uh, um, 20, 30 years uh, um, interested to the saga of Twilight. Uh, there is a lot of uh, people uh, that arrive here uh, also these days I saw some uh, girls uh, or girls with the family that arrive and they try to go to the uh, streets of, uh, the, um, of the book. We're, we're all really excited to be here because it's just like reliving all the stories and everything as well so it's really exciting. It's just really amazing really to see what it's all like and it's really um, like old and it's just what you think it will be like really. Um, to be in the real place, it's a great feeling. Um, I remember also the film and the book and I try to think um, where some things are and to stand there, it's great. It's really cool to be here and just see like how like how they chose it, how like, it fits the story like perfectly. The idea of like the old Italian town and like the Volturi, right, everything like that. So it's really cool to see it properly. I've gotten a lot that, oh, Volterra exists. I thought only Forks exist. I thought she just made Volterra up. The magic that is described in being Volterra, it is a completely true thing. It's not just something made up for literary purposes. It, it truly feels when you're here that you're in another world. There's nothing else like it. And I mean, I think that was why I was slightly disappointed when the filming of New Moon occurred and location wasn't 
decided here just because you wouldn't get that genuine and that, you know, that authentic taste of the beauty that Volterra actually has within itself. It makes you feel like you're part of something much bigger than just your small group of friends or something. You're part of a whole and it gives you a sense of completion. Una sera di novembre, un visitatore, un turista mi ha chiesto, eh, io stavo uscendo da questo palazzo, mi ha chiesto se quella nebbiolina che c'era, era sera ormai, quella nebbia che c'era eh, nella piazza era stata fatta per i turisti perché c'era questi lampioni, la luce debole dei lampioni che illuminava, che illuminava questa, questa nebbia che alleggiava sulla piazza in un'atmosfera magica. E mi, ha, e mi ha chiesto per, se era per i turisti, in realtà io ho detto no, è, è reale, è, questa è Volterra. It's just really cool to like be where you, Babella obviously walked and you kind of feel like you're part of their story because you're where they've been and you feel like you're part of it and like you're in the story with them. And it's such a like pivotal moment of the storyline as well, it's really, it's really strange to be here. <laughs> it's really cool. Yeah, I've wanted to come for quite a while, so. It's so cool, just like. Edward's been here, so you, you can imagine him up there and like Bella running through like the back streets up to it, so it's really cool. There was some kind uh, of pride <laughs> to, see, uh, to see the name of Volterra in a movie that so, uh, so many people uh, loved. It was uh, so strange and so fascinating uh, for uh, the fun and for uh, Volterra too. It was kind of some destiny <laughs> of uh, the Twilight Saga and, uh, and our town. My experience with how the city was described was quite accurate. The only thing was that fountain, which doesn't exist in the square. And every year there's a handful of tourists that, you know, they come up and they ask for direction. They say, um, where is the fountain? And it always, you know, takes a while to explain that it was, you know, just literary license to kind of just add a fountain into the middle of the square, which, you know, works very well in the book. But for the most part, I think that Volterra was described quite well, which seeing as Stephanie Mayer had not come here prior to writing the book, I think that was quite spectacular that she was able just researching the city and looking on, you know, at images from it, she was able to truly understand why everyone loves the city so much and that kind of eerie beauty that the city has within it. I think that it was a very uh, interesting and beautiful experience for me, for my work, because uh, um, it's not unusual for a people that work in a, in a municipality of 10,000 inhabitants work with, uh, with the whole world. The history for us is part of life, and so we uh, like a lot this connection. Il, poi il, il vero impatto con, con il fenomeno Twilight è iniziato nel dicembre 2008 quando si è cominciato a parlare delle riprese del film e quindi lì c'è stato tutto il lavoro eh, per capire se era possibile portare il film a Volterra e poi la fase successiva una volta girato il film due importanti raduni nazionali dei, dei fan di Twilight che eh, siamo riusciti a realizzare a Volterra soprattutto il primo è stato importantissimo perché in quell'occasione la troupe che stava girando appunto New Moon eh, da Vancouver mandò un video messaggio di saluto ai, ai partecipanti al raduno che su eh, YouTube fece il giro del mondo il giorno dopo fu il video più visto al mondo perché c'erano appunto i saluti Ciao Bella Volterra It was an amazing opportunity for Volterra and of course we were disappointed then when they didn't shoot then in Volterra. But people got aware of Volterra, so Volterra is on the map. They put it on the map. Of course we were disappointed that they didn't shoot the movie here. We then had to go on, do our thing, and we became the city of the book. We have never uh, sold ourselves as the city of the movie. Also if sometimes it would, so it's hard in the office as well, people coming, they are sure that the movie was shot here, and I have, it happens sometimes that uh, girls start crying because they realize they are in the wrong city for them. When the book first came out, when I first read it, since I didn't exactly know where 
um, Stephanie Mayer had based it. It was mostly kind of like a guessing game of that's where they go down to get to the Volturi's lair, and you know that's the building where she like you know creates the whole you know the whole scene set in Volterra. And then when she finally, when she released where she imagined everything to be, it was mostly like. I understand how she could have, you know, pictured that place and, you know, I was right. It was in that building, it was in that alleyway. And it was it was really nice to know that the streets where you walk down every single day, so many other people are kind of like looking at it. I wanted to see the location and I wanted to see the roundabout uh, and yes, it was it was quite amazing. Looking around, you think it could be the sort of place that like down one of the alleyways there could be a vulture eye hiding. It's really exciting to be here, to just, yeah. It gives you more of a feel, so you know m more what it's like. Even without Stephanie Mayer visiting um, the city, I think that it was represented very, very well, and that the, um, the words that she used to capture the city's essence were very accurate. There are a lot of things to see. Um, first of all, and the most important thing, is the main square. Now, it's the main square for Volterra, the Piazza dei Priori, but it's also the main square for the scene in the book. Um, it is one of the oldest and most be beautiful medieval squares in Tuscany, and it's also where Bella runs across to save Edward. Um, there are many city gates in the beautiful Etruscan and medieval walls of Volterra to visit, including the gates that Bella and Alice passed and entered to come into the city of Volterra, and of course the, the gate that they used together with Edward to flee the city of Volterra. Um, there are many lanes and alleyways and uh, covered areas where we think Edward may have been waiting and, and areas where we think that the Volturi may have used uh, to hide from the sunlight. And of course the Palazzo Viti and its cellars, um, which perhaps is really the lair of the Volturi. Uh, but in general, Volterra is a beautiful, magical, romantic town. And this is the setting for a sort of Romeo and Juliet-esque scene. Uh, one of the most beautiful love stories that we've seen in recent years where Bella s saves Edward. She stops him from taking his own life. Um, and I think just getting a feel for the city of Volterra as you walk through the streets and feel the romanticism vibrate throughout the town uh, really helps to understand uh, how poignant it is to have this scene set in the city. But in this area, there's just so much to see. Uh, in Volterra itself, it's a town with, of course, 3,500 years of history. Uh, the beautiful countryside that surrounds Volterra with uh, ruins of ancient castles that you can take hikes to, the marvelous vineyards, the olive oil farms, uh, the sheep farms where they make amazing cheeses. The, so, of course, for lovers of food and wine, um, but art and history and culture and just Italianness in general, uh, this is a wonderful place to come and stay. People were asking, where are the places? Where do we have to go? And we were very busy in the tourist office pointing out the, all the sites on the map. So we thought, well, why don't make, first of all, a, a, a map, a special new moon map where all the places are indicated and then also a trail so people can follow the trail on the map. That's what they were asking us. And to avoid that, we always have to write it down by hand on the already existing maps. We saw the necessity to do a trail. So we sat together with tour guides, with Alessandro, who is very good at history, took the book and line by line we saw what, what trail to do. And it was first of all me and, and some other people. And yes, then there was a request from a lady from the States. She asked us to do a tour. And as I was the one involved at this point, uh, the most involved in, in, in the whole organization said, well, and she was English speaking, so well, I give it a try. So, <laughs> as the tour was already set, so the maps were out, and yes, and I had this request from the lady from the US, and she only had seven days in Europe. 
So she had one day London, one day Paris, one day Rome, and then I think, yeah, and two days Rome, and one day she came to Volterra. Um, so she landed in Pisa and came straight to Volterra with, she was actually from the Bahamas, then I got to know, with her son, eight-year-old son. And this was his uh, birthday present to come here to Volterra and to, the, to do the New Moon tour. And that was the baptism of uh, the New Moon tour. People have traveled as far away as South America or Asia. Many people come from the United States, from England, from Germany, um, and from all over Italy and local towns to come and do the tour. Um, and most people are quite surprised uh, by what they find in the tour and especially with the ending. It was really a, an impact. So our work changed completely, completely in the tourist office. Of course, it was then not possible anymore that I, only me, myself, continue doing the New Moon tours. We, so we, instruct, we instructed the guides of Volterra that they become our official Volturi guides. Because it was just not possible anymore to do it. Also because the groups were, the, um, the groups were always fully booked. And we sometimes had to do two groups in an evening. So it was not on Friday and Sunday, um, 2009 and 2010. And they were so well booked because, of course, people were curious, they wanted to see, but they also wanted to be guided. And as we always try to make a mixture of uh, Volturi and uh, also history of Volterra, to also show them Volterra because that's our mission. We were, of course, they came to Volterra because of Twilight, but we want to show them what our city has to offer. And it was a great mixture also for, for parents. So also parents started coming on the tour because they also had a benefit out of the tour. And yes, and then our, our work changed completely. Started coming, we saw people coming from Singapore, Never had a tourist from Singapore before. Iran, Iraq, so Iraq, no, Iran. <laughs> and so really people started coming from all over the world. And sometimes countries, I thought, well, it's amazing that Twilight is popular there as well and that they come to Volterra. Maybe they're just one week in Italy, as often happens, and, but they come to Volterra. So of course, the major part is like girls from 13 to 20. I would say about 40%. And the rest is made up of a lot of different uh, target groups. So one is, of course, the girls between 20 and 30. Then we have Twilight moms, and we also have Twilight grandmas. So sometimes in the beginning, I was uh, I, I had some embarrassing situations because I, for example, I had two guys coming in into the into the office, and they asked me for the new moon map and so on. I said, well, your girlfriend, she can come in, so she she can ask herself, well. Actually, it's for me, and they were gay, so <laughs> it's so it's really also guys. So sometimes, really, we, we think we never think of, of, of boys or guys as as a potential fans, but they are they are as well. And and also our grandmas, they are great. Um, we have teachers coming from all over the world because they want to introduce the story to the students. Then and yeah, so it's it's really I think forty percent is about under 20, and the rest is above. So that was really surprising. When I do the, the New Moon tours in Volterra, I, it's really interesting for me to meet the people who come and hear about what their reaction is to, to the books and to the saga. Um, and I often encounter teenagers and parents accompanying them. Um, and I think sometimes the parents say they're accompanying the, the kids and aren't really interested, but I think the parents are really interested as well. Um, but I, one interesting thing is that a lot of parents tell me that their kids really didn't like reading at all until they started reading the Twilight Saga. Um, and it was sort of a, a, a beginning for them of getting into other books and, and reading more and more. Um, so I think a lot of parents have perceived a definite positive value to the Twilight series in getting their kids into reading. The tour that we do lasts a little bit more than an hour. And um, we generally start in the main square of town, the, the Piazza dei Priori, which is the center of life and uh, actually very important to the story in New Moon, but we get back to that a little bit later on. We start by going down to the Etruscan Gate, where uh, we think that, well, that's actually the end of the story in terms of the book, because that's where Alice and Bella and Ed Edward will, will flee the city. Um, as Bella turns back and looks at the walls and, and sees these formidable walls that you'll have to see again in the near future, uh, no longer as a mortal. 
After that, we start going from the beginning of the story. We will follow along the, the walls of the city of Volterra, parallel to the road that Alice and Bella used as they first arrived in Volterra in their race against time. Um, and we head towards uh, the first gate that they notice, not the gate that they enter through, but a, a gate that they see, and that's basically the, the point in time in which they realize that it's not a normal day in Volterra. Uh, there is a festival going on. They're celebrating the patron saint of San Marco. Um, and it's not going to be as easy as they thought to be able to get into the main square and, and reach Edward in time because the city is filled with people. Um, from that point, we also go, uh, go past a beautiful medieval font called the font or fountain of San Felice, Saint Felix, where there is a couple trap doors. Well, now you can't enter the doors, probably it's a good thing, um, but the doors give access to underground tunnels that crisscross the city of Volterra. Uh, and they really exist. Now, they're not connected, they're not open today, there's no tour of the tunnels, but we wonder why these tunnels were made. Um, but if we think about the presence of the, of the Volturi in Volterra for over 3,000 years, of course it makes sense that they would need um, some way of traveling from one side of the city to another, some way of getting to the city gates to get out of Volterra so they could find someone or something uh, to provide them blood, uh, to quench their thirst. And so the tunnels perhaps were used by the Volturi. After that, we continue on to the Porta San Francesco. That's another city gate, and that's the gate that we believe Alice and Bella entered the city through. That's also where they encounter the town policeman, the traffic policeman, who stops them and tells them that they cannot enter the city today, there are festivities going on, um, but Bella, with a little bit of a bribe, uh, convinces the policeman to let her in, and thus that yellow Porsche enters the city walls and races up the street, and we follow it in its tracks um, until we get to a little crossroads where there's a chapel of St. Christopher, the patron saint of of, of travelers, and we think maybe he gave a little hand to Alice and Bella in deciding which fork in the road to take as they head towards the main square again. Finally, back in the main square, there's a little lane, less trafficked than the larger road that gives you access into the main square, and that's where we think Bella got out of the car and started running on her own two feet, um, trying to navigate the thousands of people uh, in the middle of the square. There actually has never been a fountain in the main square of Volterra, so she couldn't have really tripped in the fountain as she does in the story. Um, but as the bell tolls on the bell tower of the Palazzo dei Priori, our town hall building, she ran as fast as she could across the, uh, the main square and we follow in her footsteps until we get to a little lane on the opposite end of the square called Vicolo Mazzoni. It's a lane many people walk past and never notice, but it's right there on your left. An archway gives way to a, a, a covered space, an area where no sunlight reaches, a perfect place for Edward to stop and wait as he contemplates and gets himself ready for walking out under the sunlight to reveal to the world that vampires do exist. But Bella gets there just in time, and we try to get there just in time as well. Then, right actually, right behind the covered space, there's a manhole to an underground tunnel, if you will. Um, and that's where the, the Volturi would appear from. Um, but we don't usually uh, torture guests and visitors to Volterra with a trip down the manhole. Instead, we go overground to the cellars of the Palazzo Viti, um, which is where we believe that Jane and the Volturi led Bella and Edward uh, after their meeting in Vicolo Mazzoni. When the story of New Moon came out, there was, of course, immediately a Volturi palace. Where do the Volturi live? So we individuated the Palazzo Viti as a potential Volturi palace as also um, the distance to um, Piazza dei Priori was more or less what uh, took them from the underground tunnels to Palazzo Viti, so that was a coincidence. So that's why Palazzo Viti became known from 2008-2009 on as the Volturi Palace. Allora, il film, come, come tutti i film, è costruito in studi, eh, quindi ricostruisce la realtà in modo un po' deformato. Nel film non si vede Volterra obiettivamente, perché anche eh, il luogo dove si radunano i volturi è un luogo che non fa parte diciamo, della tradizione anche architettonica di Volterra, è un luogo diverso. 
tant'è che il luogo dove noi facciamo radunare i voltori è un luogo molto più severo, eh, molto meno importante dal punto di vista architettonico. The Palazzo Viti and its cellars perhaps is really the lair of the Volturi. And the tour finishes with a surprise ending inside the cellars of the Palazzo Viti. Annie, as I presented myself in the beginning, is actually my nickname. My real name being Heidi. Um, and therefore, if anyone would like to have alabaster skin, I might just be able to help you. Right. So please follow me up the lane. We'll lead them into a first century BC Roman cistern that is part of the cellars of this historic palace. Now in that uh, cistern, um, they will encounter the Volturi of Volterra. <laughs> survived. Uh, most people survive uh, and will enjoy a glass of type O red wine uh, or a juice and a bit of a snack as they are able to uh, meet the Volturi in person and leave a message on the wall uh, where you can, where graffiti is allowed in the cellars of the palace. But of course in the end they are free to go. <laughs> and leave then the, the system again and leave through the, through the city center. But definitely at the end, they go through the Etruscan gate, uh, Porta Larco, which is famous, especially for the three heads. And who others should they be then? Aro, Caius and Marcus. They um, make sure that uh, Bella, Alice and Edward and our fans really leave the city. That's their agreement, they have to leave and so after that they're sure that they have left. The Volturi tours, they're quite accurate and they really got you into the mood of the books and they make you kind of think back about everything that you've read and everything you know about the saga. And I think that Volterra is a beautif beautiful city on its own, but I think that if you're a fan of Twilight, there's such a larger appreciation to it because you're, it's something that you're actually able to touch of something that you adore so much. It's a real element to something that is completely fantastic and completely fictional. So if you come as a fan to Volterra and you've read the book, of course, you will find that your fiction becomes reality. Uh, you will find all the places that you read about already, you can find them in the book. The only thing that you won't find is the fountain. It was very Wonderful, um, and uh, I can't describe it. Oh. We run and we, we, we step in the steps as, as Bella did it in the tour, and we just looked out if we uh, see the yellow uh, Porsche, but we didn't, so uh, <laughs> maybe we were late, but it was amazing, yes. I would come back to Volterra, it's a, it's a great city, and all the, all the people are laughing, and, and it's great, yeah. It's nice to know that the culture of Volterra is being appreciated because we've got so much history and it was the last Etruscan like city conquered by the Romans and it's still a pretty intact medieval city and we're very proud about our culture and proud about our history and but we understand the fact that we are still a small town that with many other cities in Italy for example Rome and Florence the minute you say it, the first things that pop into your head art history history itself whereas Volterra it's kind of always been obscure but it's nice because whether people are fans or not of the book and the films you know that there's something relevant and kind of new 
that took place where you're from. It was an important, um, an important moment for, for Volterra. Volterra is an amazing place where not only the people I know, but lots of other visitors enjoy coming and tend to come back. It is a town that uh, has a vibrant local community. It is filled with restaurants and cafes. Uh, it's a wonderful town to stroll down the lanes and alleys and streets, and it'll take you several weeks to discover all of them. Um, it's also in the center of Tuscany. If you look at a map of you know the main cities in Tuscany with uh, Pisa along the coast and Florence, nobody can miss Florence, inland along the Arno River, and then to the south, Siena, it forms a triangle. And right in the center of that triangle is Volterra. Um, a lot of people choose to visit Volterra and use it as a base for a several day or a week or, or two week vacation. Because from Volterra it is so easy to radiate, radiate out and visit even the Tuscan beaches along the coast or the, the, the hill towns, the cities of art like Florence and come back to a charming quaint hill town in the evening for a relaxing dinner and glass of wine. Volterra has a history of 3,000 years which is a real long time. Now there is a new part of history, Etruscans, Romans, medieval culture. <laughs>
The city still has a very strong medieval feel. All the buildings are really interesting and different. Quite an isolated town. They're still really old and rustic, and the buildings are beautiful. Volterra is famous for their medieval and Etruscan architecture. So Volturi are the ancestors of the Etruscans from 3,000 years ago. And it's such a like pivotal moment of the storyline as well. It's really, it's really strange to be here. It is really intense, and it always makes me feel like I know that she's going to save him, but everyone's kind of on the edge of their seats, waiting to see what's going to happen.
This is a way of showing the city of Volterra and everyone who visits it who's really in charge in town. Aro, Caius, and Marcus. It makes no sense. It's unexplained. The spark between us makes everything okay. You're the catalyst, and you are the risk. Imperfect though we are, lost in days like this. Ah. Uh.